Four in the books. It's Isaiah's song. Um, and we're, I don't know, we're just going to sing this and sing that this is what we're believing for. That water is coming to the thirsty. Yes. Hallelujah. Though you are empty, he is the well. And draw from him and he will provide. And you know, I feel that we can be we can be that well, you know, because he dwells in us. And so we can be that well that goes out to bring water to the thirsty out there. Joy for your sadness, heaven's open. 
but toward at the very end of the movie, they in the, in the movie in the book they break a curse, and things all of a sudden start to work out. And and the last part of it is the land that was barren for genera like a, 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 a gener whole generation it had been barren for years or several generations it had been barren for years and years and years. Finally, the rain started to pour and they all looked up to the sky and just like reveled in the rain that was coming down and I'm just seeing I'm seeing just rain just water springs of living water just wells of living water and revival just being birthed just overflowing in this season hallelujah hallelujah
Oh 
over us, Father. God, let the waters rise. Let the waters rise. Though the seas will rise. Oh, the seas will rise. Let that wave, let that wave wash over you right now. That wave of God's love, that wave of God's revival. Before we can ever have revival out there, we gotta have it in us. It's gotta be a wave that rises up in us. Pull that wave of God's love, that wave of revival and rising. It's building. It's building. Oh, God. It's building. It's building. It's rising. It's rising. It's building, God. It's rising. It's building. It's rising. Oh, it's building. Hallelujah. It's rising. It's building. It's rising. It's building. It's rising. Hallelujah. It's building in our soul. Stir it up. Holy 
Jesus. told Timothy, he said, stir up the gift that is within you. He said, Timothy can stir it up. Stir up that gift that is within you. And then ask the Holy Spirit, like Elijah said, ask the Holy Spirit to just let it flow out of you. Yes. He's not done with you this morning. He's not done with you this morning. He wants you to go deeper. He wants you to go deeper in. Deeper in. Deeper in. He wants to birth. Yes. When you give birth, it's not it's not a pretty sight. It's not a, a, a peaceful, calming sight. When birth is being given, it's intense. It's intense. He needs that intensity. He needs that intensity. A, a, a stirring up is not a quiet, peaceful, somber affair. A stirring up is loud. When he begins to stir, there is a volume, there is a sound. Yes, Jesus, stir us, God. Stir us, God. Your 
family member needs to be baptized in the Holy Ghost and you can lay hands on them and see that happen before your eyes when they are truly hungry for that. You don't have to get them here to a service. You can do it right out there. When you see that hungry heart and you tell them what is available to them through the Word of God, through His Spirit, you're going to be the one laying hands on them. And they start speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. They're the ones who rise up and say, I'm not in pain anymore. Y'all, this is no game. I'm not playing. I didn't come here to play and you didn't either. Debbie talked about that price Jesus paid. Megan talked about how he did it for the joy that was set before him. When we don't flow in those living waters, it's almost like his death was in vain. Like, like what did he die for? If we're not going to go out there and minister to the world, the love of God, the peace of God, the miracles of God, Oh, God, yes. says I want you to lock eyes with him and when you lock eyes with him and he's what you see he will flow in these things when you see him
and I felt God like, I felt God saying to me, you, everyone in here is called for a specific purpose and a, 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 specific, a specific job that he has for us to do. But inside of that calling, each of us decides where we jump. Each of us decides the impact because the higher you are when you jump, the greater impact there's going to be when you hit the water. And I felt him saying that to me is that each of us has a specific job. Some might be to preach in stadiums and some might be to minister to the homeless or the few or like just a small number of people. But I felt like in each calling, there is a margin for impact. And we get to decide that impact. And I felt him saying, there's so much further you can go. There's so much further you can go. And I felt him just like I saying, just like, like press on. Like press on because you can decide how big of an impact you're going to make. is a Todd White who's going to go out and help change the world internationally. Then your one witnessing and ministering in that grocery store changed the world. More than that stadium preacher even. There's no comparison. There's no competition. We just do what he tells us to do. Where he leads me, I will follow. Some of y'all are going to testify about some things you felt today, some things he's doing today. Before we all go our separate ways in a little while, whenever he leads us to go, I want us to take everything, because he's, he's, he's not nearly done. Take everything you felt, everything that you've heard today, into your life and realize that what we talked about earlier before all of this came with the singing it all relates it all goes together and it flows beautifully by the spirit of God because that humility that we talked about that flowing in the humility and the love of God that we said is a key and it is it goes with all this it goes with the climbing higher you say yeah but climbing higher sounds prideful no it's not Climbing higher in God simply means you want all of Him you can get and you're just going to keep climbing higher in Him so you can dive deeper and make that greater impact. There's, if, if there's pride in it, you don't have to worry. You're not going to make an impact. It's only the humility in climbing higher that's going to make that impact. And I want to say this to you. I want you to keep playing. You can stay here or whatever. I'm not going to go into some deep sermon, but I want to say what I felt God dealing with me about last night when I came home from Passover, if you don't mind, Meg. If we... And y'all can do whatever you feel. Last night, whether, and I know some of y'all couldn't come, I totally understand that. So whether we were together or not, we all went through Passover. Passover was still on this earth last night. Well, I think what we're... Ooh, I feel this by the Holy Ghost. Ooh, I didn't know this was coming. I feel that the season we are entering into right now is very symbolic of the feast that we are in right now, which is, as I mentioned earlier, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, the Torah, the Law of God, your first few books of the Bible there, the, the Torah tells us that the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover and the Feast of First Fruits were three different things, but they all come within a week. 
But because of that, the, the world, the Jews have made it all one feast they call Passover. Well, but Passover is really done, biblically speaking. We're in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I want you to take this spiritually. I didn't see this going this way this morning, but now he's, I see it, Lord. I want you to take this spiritually. Who is the bread of life? Jesus. Call his name out. Jesus. Jesus. Who was unleavened, meaning he had no sin? Jesus. Jesus. We're in the season right now of unleavened bread in a double way. We're in that season of unleavened bread for seven days on God's calendar. We are entering into that season of unleavened bread spiritually in a way we haven't before if we will be sure that the leaven is purged out of our life. What is leaven? Biblically speaking, you know what leaven is. It's, it's the yeast or the rising agent that we put in breads to make them rise. If not, if you didn't put that in there when you try to bake a loaf of bread, it's going to be flat, fairly flat. So we put the yeast in there, and the yeast puffs it up. It inflates it. And Jesus said in his word, he said, Beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Beware that leaven. Now when he said that, his disciples were like, Is he talking about bread? Now is he talking about because we didn't have any bread? And Jesus said, Why can't you see this, what I'm saying? You know, sometimes Jesus was just real blunt with them. He's like, Why can't you see this? He said, I'm, talk, I'm not talking about bread. He said, I'm talking about their doctrine and the arrogance that they have when they carry out their doctrine. He said, beware of that. He said in another, I think he said that in Matthew. I could, I could have these mixed up. One was Matthew, one was Luke maybe. But in another of the Gospels, he said, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. And he said, which is hypocrisy. Now, if we want to go forth and be this changing force with that living water just flowing out of us, that living water is not going to flow out of us if we have the arrogance in our doctrine. Oh, we know the Holy Ghost. We, ooh. When there's arrogance in that, you can just forget it. You're going to be full of stagnant water. Hypocrisy? Do you know what hypocrisy is? I looked it up in the Greek last night. Hypocrisy... It, it listed in Strong's Concordance, it said dissimulation. Well, sometimes that's leading you on a wild goose chase right there because you're like, wait a minute, I looked up hypocrisy and it gives me a word I don't know. So, you know, you look it up. Dissimulation means basically you're pretending to be something you're not. Or you're pretending to have feelings that you, well, you're being false. <laughs> hypocrisy. Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who were the religious leaders at that time, beware of that leaven, that sin, of the arrogance of, the, of them and their doctrine and their hypocrisy. You know, it's like me coming up and being like, hey, Elijah, it's so good to see you. I can't stand him. You know, he, he does all this. You know, that, that is the straightforward meaning of what hypocrisy is. We pretend to be what we're not. We pretend to feel a way that we don't. If we're going to have this move of God we're believing for, the church, oh, the church is going to have to come into a unity. As Jesus prayed, he said he prayed that we all could be one. We're going to have to come into a unity that we're not backbiting each other. And I don't see that in this church. Praise God. I don't want to see it in this church. We don't need to be backbiting because that's pride in, in itself. If we sit and talk about others and we backbite and we don't like the way the preacher did that or the song leader did that or that singer did that or that, if we're backbiting that way, that's pride in us. Coming out thinking we can criticize somebody else. Now sometimes things need to be corrected, but there's a correct way to do that and we do it in love. Now, I do want to read you a scripture. I've already, we've alluded to a lot of scriptures, but I want, I want to read you this. We've already, half of this on these, this paper from last night, we've already talked about. We've already done it. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. Again, Passover's done. You eat the Passover meal when Passover is ending. Passover began Friday night at sunset. Ran all day Saturday. And at, when it's just about sunset, you eat your Passover meal at the end of it. We have now begun the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I'm going to read a couple of things here to you. 
Keep playing me. That sets the stage. Exodus 12, 17 through 20. I'll just read it. You don't have to turn. So you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. For on this same day, I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. I want you to see this spiritually in your life. Has he brought you out? Has he brought Egypt represents the world of sin and leaven? Has he brought you out? So if he's brought you out, you are going to observe for the rest of your life this Feast of Unleavened Bread, spiritually speaking. He said, therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at evening, that was last night, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. Remember what we talked about a few weeks back. 21 represents 3 times 7. There's a perfection there. Three sets of seven is 21. He said until the 21st day. In a sense, 21 can represent even eternity. For seven days, no leaven, no sin, no pride, nothing puffed up shall be found in your houses. Since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off. Now, this is serious business. They were talking about literal yeast in bread. And, and God had it laid out in the law. We're going to go into it for us spiritually. He had it laid out in the law that whoever eats that leavened bread would be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he's a stranger or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwellings you shall eat unleavened bread. Look at the penalty for that. He said even if you have a stranger in your land and they eat leavened bread, we have to cut them off. Now, we know the merciful God we serve. What I'm telling you, if we sin, if we have sin in our lives, the Bible says that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We go boldly before the throne of grace and repent, and He makes it as if it never happened. But what I have to stress to us, what I feel from God this new season we're entering into, is we have to guard against that leaven that would puff up and that would dam up those living waters that, that Elijah was speaking over us to rise up in us. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge, purge in the Greek means clean it out totally. Totally get rid of it, cleanse it out. Purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Jesus told a story one time about a woman who had seven gallons of, of meal of flour to, to make some kind of bread. She put a little bit of yeast in it and it leavened the whole lump. Just a little bit. Leavened seven gallons of meal. Jesus was trying to stress to us how even a little bit of pride, how even a little bit of sin, how even a little bit of hypocrisy can totally mess up the whole lump. The people of God, the closer we draw to Him, here's the key. You know, you can sit here all day and say, oh, i got to get rid of it. He told us to purge out the leaven, and he did. Purge out the leaven, purge out the leaven. i got to shine a light in me and see what's wrong with me. That's not how you do it. You draw closer to him. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. You see him. Ooh. You lock eyes with him. And when you lock eyes with him and everything else is shut out, you don't care what people think about you. You don't care what they say. You know, I, I, don't, even, I don't even care anymore on Facebook if people say they're weird down there. And they, they should just sing three songs and sit down and have a sermon and just have it like a program. I don't care. We can't care anymore what they think. I love you all. But we can't care what they think. And when you lock eyes with him, automatically you want to purge out the leaven. You're like, I don't want this anymore. I don't want to be prideful in any way. I want to get rid of, because a little bit leavens the whole lump. Oh, Jesus, hallelujah. 
Oh, hallelujah. We talk about the feast. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. We talk about the feast of unleavened bread and this new season of unleavened bread. We are moving into, moving with the unleavened bread himself. Jesus, no sin in him. And then the leaven purged out of our lives, moving into this new season of looking solely at him. As we do this, I want you to remember that unleavened bread wasn't just used at this time of year because the Jews were remembering when they were brought out of bondage and they didn't have time to let their bread rise and they had to eat it unleavened and take it with them. Oh, it's so much deeper than that. Unleavened bread in the Bible was used and oh, I feel this over all of y'all right now. I want to just lay hands on everybody right now. And, oh, Unleavened bread was used in many different ceremonies in the temple in the Old Testament to sanctify new leaders. They brought unleavened bread. If you were going to say, I'm going to be a Nazarite, you know, if you had that Nazarite vow you had taken where you were going to dedicate yourself so much to God that you wouldn't let even let wine or anything touch your lips, if you were going to be a Nazarite, you brought unleavened bread to the temple when you were being sanctified for that, for that, whoo, in that vow. Unleavened bread was part of your vow. If you were in the priestly line and you were going to come in and begin your priestly duties in the temple, the offering you brought was unleavened, ooh, unleavened bread. Who knew you could feel this about unleavened? Praise you, God, for this symbolism in unleavened bread. When Gideon was called to go lead an army and free his, some of his people there where he lived in Israel, and he said, me? Is this, is this really what you want, God? And he said, I'm going to have to put a fleece before you. You know what Gideon was doing? At one point when Gideon was still unsure that God was really calling him, he put out an offering of unleavened bread. He put out that offering because unleavened bread represents a call to service, a call to have that servant's heart. Unleavened bread is what the priest used when it was time to consecrate themselves. When Gideon put that unleavened bread out, an angel sent, sent fire down and burned up that offering to say, yes, yes, God has called you to this. And what I'm saying over you right now, every single one of you, from the youngest to whoever could be the oldest, I'm saying right now, God has called you to go forth. It doesn't matter how young. I'm reading a prophetic book right now that I told y'all somebody sent me in the mail. Somebody just felt to send me this book by Lana Bowser the prophetess. And she's saying, watch out for the children because the children are going to be ministering. They don't have to wait till they're 20 to start preaching. She said, the children are going to begin to minister. And we older people, she said, God told her, she says, that we older people should not look at that like, well, they're just a kid. I don't know if they know that they can really say anything that I can learn from. 100% they can. By the Spirit of God, 100% they can. You're entering into that season of a perpetual feast of unleavened bread. And we purge out this leaven. We purge out this leaven by locking our eyes on Him, focusing on Him, and you're not going to want to have leaven. The first temptation in the garden was leaven. It was sin. It was pride. Satan said, hey, you know you want to be like God. Don't you want to be like God? Well, come do this. You'll be like God. He appealed to the leaven. He appealed to the pride. Like Elijah said earlier, the world has, has equated humility with weakness. It's not. Humility is the stronger of the two. Of pride, humility, humility is by far the strongest. Now, I don't feel to say anything much else about that. If you have a word from God, say it. Because He's sending us forth in such a powerful way today when we go our way. I believe we're changed. I believe we're different. Not only by what we felt when the, when the music and the singing was going on. Because that was powerful as He exhorted us with the Holy Ghost to rise up. But I believe that His word, that even just this little bit that we heard, his word makes a difference. He said, purge out the old, purge out the leaven. Get rid of it. Go forth with that humility and the love of God. Oh, God, how I praise feel, you. Say it, brother. I feel that we all need to take time to pray.
pray and I'm speaking super to myself right here. I think we all need to take time to pray to check that we are really in love with God. Oh, Jesus. And if we're not, if we pray and we realize that we're not, we need to pray, God, make me more and more in love with you. And he'll do it. And he will do it. Yes. Because I think I think that he needs a people that are truly in love with him. Yes. And I think he needs a passionate people. Passionate. He needs a people that are passionate for him. I also feel God saying that we need to change the way we're and the reason we're coming to church. Ooh, say it. We're we should be coming to church to organize. You know, we should be coming to church. Ecclesia. We should be coming to church like an army. Yes. Coming to be given our marching orders. Yes. We are, uh, I think so oftentimes we're coming to church because it's like, man, I just got to get to church this week. I just got to get to church. And, and that everybody goes through that. But we should be going to church with the intent of we are going to tear down works of the enemy. We're going to build each other up for us to then go out. Uh, if we are getting filled up, it's only so we can pour out. Absolutely. I feel that God's people, like we should be coming to church with intent. intent. I think, and I'm speaking to myself, yes. we can get lulled into a sense of, of habit of we just come to church every Sunday. And <laughs> So, but we can get into a habit of we're just coming to church every Sunday and I'm here to worship and lift up God, which is what you're doing. Yes. But I really feel that he needs a body that is coming with intent that every Sunday I'm going to give everything I have. Like that's, that's the way that we should be coming to church to say I'm going to give everything I have for God this morning. Because when you're doing that, you are building yourself up. You are deepening and entrenching yourself more into God. But we, I feel that we have got to be as a people coming to church with intent. That we're not coming to church thinking, well, I wonder what Les is going to preach today. This is going to be a good service. I'm going to see Belinda. I'm going to get to see the, the number. I mean, all of those other things are great and it's not bad things to want, but I think we have got to make that the absolute just overarching number one thing that we are here for is Jesus because we love Jesus, him and we have a Jesus, passion for him Jesus. and we want to see his kingdom. That's our ultimate goal. Our ultimate goal isn't for ourselves. Our ultimate goal is for him because our, our ultimate goal should be to expand his territory. To increase his territory. To increase him in this world. And I really felt him like kind of hammering into me this morning like why are you here? What is this for? Thank you. Thank you, Lord. We have to be so in love with you. The word he used, intent, I really like that. Intentional. We have to be intentional. If you'll remember last week under the tent, I said, I don't even think Elijah was there, which is interesting because this is such a confirming statement where I said we have to come to church we come to church we think it's all for us but we come to church for other people other things we're, it's not that you can't glean I want you to be blessed God wants you blessed but we gotta change he's right the mindset for why we come the word for church ecclesia in the Greek do you know what that was that was a governing body that was like a government body, like a town council, like a board. That's who you are. Church is not just pretty singing and some preaching and some testimonies. You're giving an offering. Church is coming together to make battle plans. It's a body. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a body, and it's and it's it's necessary. Yes, yes, yes. I think we look sometimes at church like this gift, and it's always oh, great. And it is a gift, and it is a beautiful thing that builds us up. But it is a necessary yes. thing to bind together with the body. The word tells us that because we're not, and we are not, and we are individuals, but we are a body. 
And I think that we have to, I also think we have to look at this as more of a team sport because it is. That we're in this together. Together. Me arm in arm with Sandy. Sandy arm in arm with Belinda. Belinda arm in arm with Katie and so on and so forth. That we need to be a body that's so in sync, like-minded. Yes. With a singular purpose because the God broke up the Tower of Babel and all of those people because they were so in sync and like-minded, but in the wrong way. Yes. But what could his body do if we all gathered together in such a zone? I think yes. we that's something that I'm just now realizing for myself that I think too much about me and what I'm going to do when I get to church. But I think that's something we should start broadening our, our thought process to say, I'm going to come together today with my brothers and sisters and be in one mind. And I'm going to be in one mind and in unity with everyone there. Because we are not a bunch of individuals in a church. We are one body. And through our oneness, we will, I mean, what was one of the last things Jesus said? which has even increased value to me now. He would have that his people be one. Yes, yes. And so I, I, I'm going to personally change my mindset when I come in this morning. I'm not going to come into church thinking, well, so-and-so is going to drag me along, or I'm going to drag so-and-so along with me, or I'm going to come into church for, to get, because I need to get this thing. I'm going to come in to be a part of a body. for where he's taken us, people of God. Higher, higher, higher on that diamond board to dive deeper through being one and all of I feel, I feel it with y'all. Guard it. Guard it. Guard that unity. Guard that love. Guard that bond. And as and I think of like a, I feel like a military, you know, when a regiment marches and runs together, I think about, you know, sometimes the stragglers that fall behind. I think I also want to make sure that I don't ever fall behind. I want to always be up there running with my brothers and sisters, you know. I want to be striving to move forward. Or I just felt that, like I don't want to ever be left behind or, or out of syncopation with my regiment. I want to be right there with them. Not just a singing group. My kids used to like in singing God. We're all gonna link arms like that and make sure nobody's left behind. I just told Megan when you when you started saying that, Elijah, I thought of how the song I want us to sing. If you gotta go, I love you. We'll let you know if we meet Wednesday night or Thursday. But I feel to sing this song, Pour Me Out. Pour me out. That living water just to flow out. You, you don't want to get out of that spot. I don't want to get out of that Pour me out. Can I say something? Please do. I want a word. Here. As I sit here, overwhelmed with all this being said, I, I keep seeing you know, the wind is blowing. So I keep looking at that window and seeing the wind really was blowing hard. It was harder that I, I see just in the spirit, Jesus is the tree, you know, the trunk, the foundation of that tree. But there are branches all over it. Yes. And I just see them swaying, just swaying. And that tree itself is unmovable. But the branches are swaying. Yes. And you know when a storm comes, the spirit had to give me this, Thank you. that when the branches are just really moving, like you see, they're less likely to be broken by the world. That's true. They, and if, if they were just stayed still when the storm was coming, they probably would be broken off. Thank you, Lord. I don't know why that came to me. Thank but you, I, I see us, the church, as the branches. Thank you. We're swaying and we're meant to sway. He's immovable. Oh, yes, God. Does that make sense? Yes. It 
We're in Him. We're in Him. He's immovable. We're in Him. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. In Him we, we live. We move. We have our feet in Him. Praise God. If anybody else feel the Word, speak the Word of God. Where is this? 136 if you want to sing it along with us. Hallelujah.
you let him pour you out, it's an endless flow. When you're flowing in his spirit, he's going to give you more, 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 more. You can keep pouring because he's going to keep pouring into you. And the Holy Ghost within you is never ending, a never ending flow. Oh, hallelujah. Right now, this morning, pour yourself out right now. Pour yourself out. Oh, give him yes. everything that yes. you've got this morning. Everything you've got this morning, give it for him. Yes. Give it for him this morning. Everything you can do to worship and praise the Lord.
about you've been at the mission field. Whether they're riding down the road in a car or they're in a house near you, they're out there unsaved. We're going out. Do you feel that? Anybody else inspired? Oh, God. Go out and spread his word and spread his love. Do his works. Do the miracles. Go do it. We're going to come back, God willing, next time, and we're going to have testimonies of what happened in these few days to Wednesday night. I would say, sister, I have a testimony. Please. Well, as I say, like, if anybody's here or watching or whatever, right. like, you feel like, what is my calling? You know, I hear her talking about your calling and you think, well, I don't know what my calling is, what does it mean? And I, and I just thought about, um, I've always thought, you know, like 25 years ago when I came here or was here, that God called me to do something and I'm not doing it. So sometimes we end up focusing on, like, what am I supposed to be doing? What is my calling? I don't hear God. Like God called us to, and I'm not saying he doesn't call you to do something, but God has called you to go out and minister. So, and I heard somebody say something about, you know, I have I have a problem with uh, talking to people. I have a problem with, you know, I, it's hard for me to express myself at the day. But we're called to serve. And and this one that came to me, I'm like, we, don't, we not only get to serve, oh. we're not just called to serve, but we get to we serve. We get to. You may not be the talker who could go talk to people, but you can serve. Like she said, you can serve. Everybody can serve. How can you go bless somebody this way? How can you go? It's different for every one of you. How can we go bless somebody? Let's go do it. I feel like right now we're like all like down on the start line of a race. Like, you ready? Get set. I wouldn't be surprised if every one of y'all started running out here at the same time, running out to get in the car to go somewhere to say, who can we serve? Who can we bless? That's what I'm talking about. That's what God does among us. That's a good word, Melinda. Anybody else has got one? I'd love to hear it. If not, who's running first? Say sister. He is faithful, and there's nothing too impossible for our Father. Nothing. Did y'all hear what she said? Would you repeat that word then? He is faithful, and there is nothing too impossible for our Father. I just want to hear it again. Nothing too impossible because he's faithful. Drop the mic. Here we go. Praise God. Good gracious, I don't run in spirits about to hit this sister. If I take off out the door. Good. So why did you go Oh, God. I got my revival shoes on. and run out the kill me. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. On the cove, here we come. Westfield, Sandy Ridge, Edward King. Here we come. Here he comes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. You got good words. Absolutely. Me too. Me too. I'm not kidding when I say I feel like we can just all get ready. Y'all feel that, right? Not just me. Oh, praise God. I love you 